Hi, my name is Jojo Mayer. We're playing tonight a show with my band Nerf at the Berghain in Berlin. Well, as far as drumming goes, I, uh, I, I started very early. Like, uh, there's, there's <clears throat> recordings of myself playing the drums when I was a year and a half old. So I can't really remember a time in my life where there was not drums. Like, uh, the, the drums is, it seems to be, uh, it's like a part of me, like almost my arms and my legs are. So the drums has always been here as like, a, a continuous entity. Uh, when everything else shifted, the drums was always here. Your personal evolution was almost inseparately connected with like the drums. So, so, so all of my personal triumphs and defeats were always <clears throat> expressed somehow in my place behind the drums. And it was just, you know, maybe recently over the past 20 years where I learned to separate myself as a person from the person that plays the drums. And so it's like a language that you can speak very well, which is enjoyable if you, if you go to a foreign country and, and you're able to communicate with, with, with people. So the drumming, as far as I'm concerned, is a communication instrument, as every music instrument. And once I, I found my pathway in whatever I do, if, if it's drumming or if I do an interview, if I try to compose a song, it, it's all about, it all serves the purpose of, of communicating uh, the values that uh, are important to me or the values that, I, that inspire me about other artists, you know, courage, uh, idealism, humor, empathy, and so on and so on, curiosity. So the, once I bring this into music, I said that makes it easier to keep the bullshit out, you know. When things align and, and when it's good, then it's a place of transcendence and, and, and peace where I don't need to think about, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm detached from, from the outcome. And that is very enjoyable. You know, that's almost like a meditation. That, that is a Zen place. But of course, as a performer, you know, you, you have to deal with the little entity that kind of shows up every once in a while and it's trying to give you advice when your insecurities start to go off, you know, go like, hey, you're, uh, you're rushing or you're dragging or you're playing too loud or the people like it or the people don't like it or uh, what the hell is going on, you know, and then you have to learn to tell that entity to take a number and, and, and have a seat. So, so I got to deal with you after the gig because right now I'm, I'm here to do something that I, that I know how to do and so don't get in my way. So it's kind of like a discipline. It's, it's, it's like meditation, actually. It's, it's, it's very close. And uh, to be in that zone is very, extremely enjoyable. I'm getting better at it. Um, it's not automatically. It's, it's kind of like something that I had to become aware of, you know, what are the thoughts and, and what are the, the occurrences that forcing me out of that zone and that's usually has something to do with being a little bit more in control of your ego and your motivation or like why you do this. When you're younger, you want to, you know, you want to prove things and, and you identify with your skill. And that's one of the things that you have to let go. 
I think that is a problem like a lot of people which are actually very talented and, 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 and very gifted and very skilled, they identify with their capabilities and that can be a total trap that will make sure that you cannot enter this zone. And uh, there was a time in my life where on a regular basis I, I walked off stage, I was completely frustrated with what I was accomplishing or what I was not able to accomplish. And, I learned from some of the people you know, that I was collaborating with or, or the people that I studied on, on how they solved that problem, or like how being able to get, get into that zone. And I think one thing which is, uh, was very helpful is like once I made a decision that I wanted to focus on my own music or my own idea of what music is and surround myself with the right people to do that. I mean, everybody in my band, you know, we're, we're, we're all trying to accomplish something. We all agree on something. Uh, the level of ego is extremely low. It's, it's very communal. So, so I think it's a very modern, people-centric way of going ahead. It's not so much product-centric. It's not like, okay, we have this product and everything else revolves around it. I think it's more like the, like the people are more in, important. So which that brings it down to a more communal and more human aspect of art. You have to have the confidence to, to say, okay, I, I do understand uh, that I have a talent or, or, or a gift that was given to me for free, which doesn't mean that I, that I had to work hard to, to articulate it and like nurture it. You know, that, that's like a lot of work, but, but I understand that I'm more talented. I have, I have more access to like music than like other people, which doesn't mean there's other people that are more talented than I am, you know, but I'm pretty happy with what I have. I believe as like a, a, a universal principle, if you have something in excess, that I think it's a good idea to try to find a way to share it. It doesn't matter what it is, if it's money, if you have a lot of money, you should try to share that with like the community or, or, or make that money go into the community to, 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 to bring your surroundings up and not be selfish about it. So um, to put myself into that position actually takes care of a lot of problems, you know, like a lot of psychological drive that, that, that will drive me into the wrong direction or like the fear that I have to prove something, like it really doesn't matter to me anymore. The idea of improvising, I think, is important in the time that we live in, simply for the reason that we're coming out of a protocol of industrialization for the past 200 years where everything ro rotates around this. It's very product-centric, everything serves industrialization. Now as we are in the fulcrum, in the change to the technological age, we lose one extreme important active ingredient that makes industrialism or the protocol of industrialization possible, which is the element of planning. And planning is a prospection into the future. Now, the problem is with that speed that we have, the future is no longer five or 10 or 15 or 30 years. The future is like next Thursday. We have no idea what the world is gonna look like. So improvisation and dealing with unforeseen occurrences is gonna be much more important in our society. And I think as always, it's always artists that experiment with new ideas. And, and then those ideas are being rendered by success rendered useful and then society changes you know and that's like uh, if you go 100 years back you know we were in a similar turmoil with like with the first world war but then it was like Picasso then it was Charlie Chaplin then it was Louis Armstrong they all came about a hundred years ago they had those discussions and 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 that articulated the 20th century so I believe as artists we are in the position to art articulate the 21st century and to experiment with new ideas, new solutions, maybe to, to consolidate that. Like w one of my favorite quotes about this comes from Gustav Mahler and he said, well, very often society uh, 
gives attributes to an individual artist or writer or, or politician or whatever, that that person is ahead of time. Well, this is definitely one way to, to look at it. But in reality, from that person's perspective, it's that that person lives in the present while everybody else still lives in the past. You know, and, and, and that shift to go, that paradigm shift or having the possibility as an artist to look at both sides and go like, okay, I'm not about the future, I'm about the present. You know, my drumming is not futuristic, my drumming is present. So that will open up maybe doors for a solution so new things can happen that uh, make us better as a society or as, as human beings. Artaud comes, comes to my mind. Uh, Artaud. Antonin Artaud? Yes. Right. Because opening the stage for the audience and mixing it up and yeah. making it more in, immediate for each and every one and yeah, gaining something out of it as the performer, not just doing it for, for the audience themselves. Evidently, uh, you know, Artaud was rendered to be an insane person by many people. You know, I mean, Artaud was, you know, half of the time he was on peyote or, or you know, on an altered state of mind. One of the difficult things about being an artist is to, you have to stand by what you believe in. And that sometimes leads to a very, very isolated and lonely place. And one of the most difficult things is to be able to bear this loneliness. You know, I think maybe there was a time in the life of, uh, of Steve Jobs where he, he was the only person that uh, maybe even his, his wife wouldn't understand what he was doing. He, he would got fired from his own company and then the company went down, they got him back and then he changed the world with his, uh, with his outlook on things. You know, that's a success story but on the same token we also have people like Van Gogh who opened the door for everybody else that came after him and he died poor and he never was recognized while he was alive, you know. So that, that is a tragedy that uh, sometimes happens in that platform of time. You also have to be lucky uh, to be recognized and uh, you can't take it for granted. So uh, I, I, I do appreciate if, if people notice what I do and, and render it useful while I'm alive, you know, because I'm on, I also make a living doing that. So it's kind of useful. As far as equipment go, of course it's more fun to play on an interface that lets you easily translate something, something that sounds good and inspires you. But a strong co conceptual idea, you should be able to, to articulate it on a, on a piece of log or like, or like a wood. Uh, you don't need great equipment to do that necessarily, you know, it's, it's helpful. For me, you know, a classic, great, good sounding drum set is something that, well, what exactly do you mean? You know, like, okay, you talk about like an 80s drum set where you mic every tom from the top and like the bottom and you change the heads after every take, you know, and you make sure everything is meticulous and has long sustain. I don't really need that environment to to say what I have to say. For me, I was for many years bothered if my drums didn't sound good. And I actually talked to a lot of people about that, you know, talk to like Dennis Chambers, for instance, you know, and like Dennis goes like, look, I, I play 200 shows a year and most of the time the sound sucks. So I just choose to not be bothered by it, you know, and I just don't let it affect me. Terry Bozio, on the other hand, had a different approach, which was like, look, when I enter the drums, no matter what awaits me, it might have sounded beautiful, and delicious last night and today my drums sound like cardboard then I have to surrender to that and then I will make art with cardboard I'll make something with that I will serve the drums my ego has to take a back seat I'm here to make something good out of this 
shitty sounding environment. And both, both approaches are a possibility. So for me, the way we record with nerve now in the, stu the studio environment, more important than what type of tension I have on like the drum head or, 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 or what it is that I actually play. Because sometimes we work with some really fucked up sounding stuff and those guys make something cool, for, cool from it. And that's also improvisation, you know, like problem solving. Like uh, I go like, okay, I'd like the bass room to go like boom. And it just goes like quack. It's a, it has a honk in it. Okay, can we do something with it? Maybe, sometimes good stuff comes out from it. Sometimes you go like, yeah, unfortunately the bass drum sounds shit, so we're just gonna put a trigger on it, okay? Because we have the possibility to like do that. Now, that is different than with my own environment where I'm calling the shots. And let's say if I play a jazz gig, which is acoustic with a grand piano and an upright bass, and I have a cymbal that doesn't, that, that gets in the way, like the frequency, it's not the right cymbal, it goes like, okay? then I will need the right equipment that blends in with the other sounds, you know. With Nerf, it doesn't really matter that much, you know. So it depends on the music that you play, you know. Uh, now I have, a, I have an old Slingerland from 1937, like a cloud batch. On this drum kit, I can play a jazz gig because it's so controlled, like, Okay, if I play it, if I bring a 26 inch bass drum to a jazz gig nowadays, most people will just panic, you know, like, oh my God, you know, this guy doesn't get it. But these are the drums where this style was created on. I can play very quiet on the, on, a, on a 26 inch bass drum, for instance. So it's all of that, you know, the sound is in my hands. The sound is in, is in my idea. But sometimes I have to surrender to like limitation. I think limitation is actually very, very, very interesting because that's when you start to become creative. That's when you start to solve problems. That's when you start to improvise. Necessity is the mother of invention. You know, it always has been. started to, to play the beats that came from electronic drum machine programming uh, or, or, or samples, I faced the dilemma that uh, maybe 20 years ago when I, when I started with that, that very soon society has to deal with it, which is being replaced by a robot. You know, like drum machines took jobs away from like drummers as Robots and computers are going to take jobs away from other people. And there was a lot of, you know, drummers going, like, yeah, drum machines have no soul, and they know that whole bullshit, you know, and, and people just aesthetically lock themselves out, and, oh, that's the devil, you know, that thing is, has no dynamics. But, you know, it, the, the music turned me on, you know, and I, I kind of liked uh, the rhythms and, like, the beats and, like, the sound, especially, you know, with the old school jungle stuff, you know, when, I, when like, you know, 1993, I heard this for the first time, you know, like, you know, those type of rhythm that reminded me of more of like the way Tony Williams played and like, you know, electronic music that beforehand was like, but it was a certain sound. So when I tried to reverse engineer those beats, the, the statistic organization of those, of those patterns was not the problem. What was the problem is to get the sound and like the feeling. So then I became aware, okay, I, I, I must do something with my drums. I have to tune it a certain way. I need a smaller drum. I need a uh, different snare thing. I need a different cymbal. I need different hi-hats. I have to muffle it a different way. I have to put some, something on top of my snare drum to acoustically reverse engineer those aesthetics. Okay, how can I get a sound from the snare that goes because the serum doesn't sound like that, usually. 
right? Then I had to go into, okay, let's do this, let's throw, put something on top of it, whatever, use a different microphone, and uh, maybe a snare drum, which is tuned in a way that is acoustically so dead that it sounds good for like the microphone. Now, over the past maybe five or six years, I changed that. I don't care about reverse engineering and electronic sounds. I'm now looking for new sound, period. And now we're coming up with sounds that you don't find in electronic music which are new. And uh, you know, rediscover the drum set as opposed to programming a drum beat, you know. So what we have, the one thing that you cannot do really with machines, I mean, you will soon be able to do it, but you know, right now it's just still limiting only because of the processing power, it's too slow to do that. I love the feeling of like hitting a drum head or like a cymbal, but when the time is ready, you know, I, I can switch to another instrument or electronic drums. It's just now electronic drums, the ones that we have, they kind of suck. They're not really musical instruments, you know, they're, they're karaoke machines, you know. I, I'm sorry, I mean, I, I know the technology is, is, is there and I wish those companies would kind of not serve the karaoke market of people that want to play drums but don't want to disturb the neighbors, but really create musical instruments because the technology is there. It's just the industrial protocol that it holds it hostage. If I hit a membrane with a piece of wood, I, I connect to, you know, 10,000 years of human experience. It connects me with the beginning of civilization, you know, and it somehow still does something that makes me feel good. The only reason why the drum set will probably not be replaced in the future is because it's fun to play the drums. There's no other reason really but, but that. The drums is the oldest instrument really, but it's also the most modern instrument because it can change the shape. You don't have that with like a saxophone, you're inside the protocol forever. With a guitar, you can maybe tune at different, different intervals and stuff like that, but the basic idea, the protocol is there. So, you know, like, like the system, you're locked into the system, like we are locked inside like the decimal system, for instance, you know. The drums is open, it's kind of as an open structure. Of course. Yeah, I'm a great dancer. No shit. I love dancing. I've never been at a party with you. <laughs> no, but you know, I mean, I wouldn't tell a drummer, you have to dance so you get better co uh, coordination. I'll say, you should dance because it's fun. It feels good. You know, I don't dance so I'm, a, I'm like a better drummer. I'm probably a better drummer because I know how to dance. You know, but it doesn't matter. I think it's like, uh, it's just a, I express a part of myself here and this feels good, you know, it, it just feels good. Um, I have a hard time to sit still when, when I hear music which is good, you know, something starts to move, you know, even if it's just the tip of my foot, you know, but I think uh, the drums and dancing were, came into this world at the same time. I don't be, believe in those interdisciplinary connections like, oh, I'm doing yoga so I can play the drums better. You do yoga so you become a better person and that will reflect in yourself being a better drummer. You know, that's the way it works, you know. The other thing is too egocentric, is too industrial protocol, too product centric, you know. balance essentially of course like you know our bodies made a certain way there's people with that play drums which are two or three times as heavy as I am I'm like a light guy there's, I'm, a, I'm a small guy there's people which are bigger you have to in, integrate that and make something that works for you it's not the same seat height that works for everybody you know especially if you play with your heel up and you and you don't bury the beater but but you play out of the bass drum it can create a lot of balance problems you know especially to play like this puts your body into a, a off centric uh, position to begin with you kind of put your shoulder up to reach that hi-hat playing like this 
is an easier balance, like in the same way as someone like a tightrope walker walks over a tightrope, he will walk like this, not like that. You know, he will probably fall off like the tightrope. So because the drums is such an open structured instrument, it's not like with the violin where you go like, okay, this is the way we're gonna do it. But it's always different for anyone. You know, you, you play double bass drum, you know, your, your body, will, it, it will force your body into like a different position. So to understand how you integrate your relationship with like the instrument, as far as like how high you see it, for instance. Like if you're a big guy, you will have to sit higher because otherwise the drums will be too far away from you. You know, like the higher you sit, the closer the drum comes to you. Also, the higher you sit, the less lifting you need to do from your legs. If you sit really low, you have to do a lot of lifting, which forces your lower back out to create a counterweight. Now that can create to like, you know, lower, lower back problems. Not if you if you bury the beater, then it's fine. But if you play out of the bass drum, then those things become more difficult. So I I kind of I kind of negotiate a seat height that gives me the best balance between being able to drop some weight from my leg to create a stroke without muscular force, but at the same time allows me. Uh, to lift my leg without too much strain uh, on my second DVD, Secret Weapons for the Modern Drummer Part 2, where I talk about the pedals, so there's an entire chapter where I go really into the detail of how you can negotiate that balance. And the balance thing will will always change. You know, like I, I play traditional grip for like many, many years, but now I'm going back to playing more match grip because my setup has expanded to my left. And traditional grip is not a good solution for that because you put a lot of uh, strain on your ro rotator cuff, you know. And as you get older, you have to be careful of those things because they can give you a problem that uh, incapacitate the way you play. So one thing maybe on a, when we talk about balance, which I find is extremely important now in, in life, but it, becoming aware of it has helped me like music, that we're always on that balancing tipping point between safety and freedom and you can't have the cake and eat it you have to negotiate you know and fear will make you go to safety if you are too much in the in the in, in the safety quarters you will sacrifice freedom and without freedom there can't be art there can't be discovery of new things so you in order to discover something new you have to fly without a net you know you have to give up freedom and i think this is something that even internally, kind of like that state of mind, in a very, very strange way, has taken care of some of my physical problems. Really just being, being ready to, to fall, you know? And that was some interesting, uh, I, I used to do martial arts like when I, when I was younger, and I, maybe I will pick this up again. In judo, for the past couple of months, you, you do nothing else but learn how to fall. So if you do judo, you're not scared of falling. The first thing you learn is not to be scared of falling, and which means you you can leave your security for like freedom and freedom of improvisation and freedom to deal with an opponent that might you might have a technique that you're not prepared for and you know how to deal with that. You know, so in martial arts you, you find a lot of those things uh, that that are useful. Uh, for, for anything else, and, and life in particular, but also music, because music is a part of life. My state of mind of like, um, uh, uh, understanding that there's a balance between freedom and, and safety somehow has opened my body, my, my attitude behind the kit up. Less fear relaxes my body somehow, you know, and I, I know I will make mistakes. I'm 100% sure and I make mistakes all the time. But not everybody notices it, you know. And as a matter of fact, you know, some of the, the bluntest mistakes that I do, like dropping a stick or getting caught and, and acknowledging to, to, to the audience, yes, I lost a stick. Sometimes makes people applaud, you know. They applaud for like a mistakes, not because I made a mistake, because I surrendered to the fact that I am on stage, yes, I'm elevated, but I'm, I'm like you, you know. So we should reserve our the privilege of being able to make mistakes, you know, because without that, you can't go anywhere. Also, one thing that has really 
helped me is I used to be extremely perfectionist, which, which has opened doors for me and, 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 and allowed me to work really, really hard to get things exactly like I, I envisioned it. It's very neurotic. And uh, many years ago, I, I abandoned the concept of perfection. I'm not interested in it anymore. I'm only concerned with clarity. So it doesn't matter if it can be really sloppy. If I can get the idea from A to B, it doesn't have to be perfect. I afford myself this luxury because I play mostly with my own band right now. So I don't have to please some neurotic uh, pop star that is hiring me to play music behind him. to Drum Talk. Uh, I, I enjoyed the opportunity to answering interesting questions. Uh, I think it's a good, good platform and uh, I'll, I'll look into it and um, hopefully you will too. And if you want to know, if you're not acquainted with, with what I do, you can look up at jojomayer.com and um, you can find more of the things that I was talking about today. So thank you very much. Max Lakritze. Ja, klar. Das ist super, super strong shit. <lacht> du musst Schweden töten, aber da... Ja, genau so in die Richtung geht's. Das ist wie Medizin schon passt. Ne? Dann nehme ich eben erst mal einen. Ja, nehmen wir einen. Für Profis. <lacht> Pro Profi Wir laufen auch schon. Gut. Aber wenn ich was gelernt habe, dann ist es immer viel früher laufen lassen. Das hast du den ganzen Dreck. <lacht> <lacht> Hi there, this is Philip speaking. I'm the host of Drum Talk. And first of all, I want to thank you for watching my video. I hope you liked it. It's season seven already, but it's not only season seven, it's also the fifth anniversary of Drum Talk. And a lot of things have changed over the years, as you may have realized. But there is one thing that is still consistent, which is it's basically just me doing all the things with some helping hands here and there. Um, so I figured maybe there are some folks out there that like my program so much, they want to maybe support the channel a little bit, which helps indeed, because I don't have any sponsor or anything whatsoever. Everything I have to pay out of my own pocket. So if you like it a lot, or just a bit, and you feel like giving me a little bit of support, there will be a Patreon page uh, up soon and I will post the links and if you feel like it, you can support me there. Anything is cool. So uh, again, thanks for watching and take care. Bye.